Thank you all for joining us this morning. We will begin shortly, ensuring other members have logged in to participate today. Thank you for joining GSBA's Health and Wellness web series, Keeping It Real, with host Lindsay T.H. Jackson. GSBA is Washington State's LGBTQ and Allied Chamber of Commerce and the largest LGBTQ chamber in North America, representing over 1,400 small businesses, corporate and nonprofit members who share the values of promoting equality and diversity in the workplace. <laughs> GSBA's health and wellness web series, Keeping It Real, will help individual leaders and organizations speak up, speak out, and move closer to reaching their full potential. Please take a minute to complete the survey at the end of the webinar. If you are on the Zoom platform, you will be redirected to the survey. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, the link will be provided in the chat box. Remember to like and share this live webinar on your social media. Today's episode is exploring how COVID-19 shifts our relationships. Now over to you, Lindsay. Good morning, everyone. Well, I guess it's morning for me. Thank you for joining us from all over the country and all over the world. Today we are exploring how our relationships are shifting during COVID-19. How has this prolonged isolation begun to impact us? And how is it impacting our employees and our clients? Joining me on the virtual couch today is researcher Ricky Thompson. She is at UW researching online communication. We're gonna go in two really interesting directions today, both looking at how her research on online dating has really given us some new insights about how we can make sure that we are promoting inclusivity in the way that we design our products and how we think about coming out of COVID-19, as well as what are some of the trends that came up that might be able to tell us a little bit about what our employees and clients are feeling at this time. Good morning, Ricky. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me today, Lindsay, on the couch. <laughs> it's a good virtual couch. It spans across the country. <laughs> Ricky, I'm really so interested in uh, this work that you've been doing. I really just had tons of light bulbs going off as you were unpacking um, how this work can really tell us so much about our lives right now, but I'd love you to start in your own words. Tell us, how did you get into researching different trends in terms of how we online date, sexual trends that come up in that? Um, you have a great story, if you wouldn't mind sharing it. Um, well, I should start by saying that I am a participant observer in my research, which means um, I started this research because I was also out there online dating. and. I found myself working with friends and looking at their profiles and um, giving advice and taking advice. And at one point, one of my friends said, are you researching this? I would pay you for this help. You should do something. So um, I decided to do that. But truth is, I had actually started by looking um, on an app way back when. And um, it was because I had been reading that um, there's an app for anything. And I was wondering, how do people find all these threesomes that they're talking about? And there was an app called Thrinder. So I had to check it out and see what it was about. And then I became interested in how do people even set up a profile? And I was like, well, I guess I have to set one up in order to figure this out. So, so I was exploring on this 
kinky app like as my first experience and I was out of town so I felt like safe nobody knows me right and um, and I didn't have any intention necessarily of going out there and doing anything I just was curious um, but it really did start me down the path of getting on all these other apps because then I wanted to compare how they were working and I was interested in how they were constructing me and how I started noticing they all have different uh, drop down menus and buttons about what kind of identity I am, including um, like some would have labels for gender of just man, woman, and that's it. Um, mm. And so for anybody who's, you know, gender non-conforming or trans, there's no option. And I, I thought that was really quite interesting. And I started noticing that sites that were much more sex forward and sex positive tended to have a lot more identity markers. Um, sexuality options, whereas mainstream sites like Tinder's and and, and uh, the uh, OkCupid's, okay although OkCupid okay has become quite progressive, but many of the mainstream sites would have very limited options. Um, you are either um, you are either straight, looking for uh, people of the opposite sex, or you're looking for the same sex. But some of them didn't have options for both for people who may be bisexual or pansexual. And so I thought, wow, how do people find connection. One of the things they have to do is figure out if it's the right app for them in terms of the dating pool who's using it, but also how the app allows them to create their own online identity through all these, you know, digital options. Um, there is a place to have a biography, a profile, but they all differ in size. And, and there's still something very constraining around identity if the buttons don't even allow you an option. I think prior to online dating, the, the example people might think about in the analog world is the census form and how the census mm -hmm. forms usually uh, once upon a time had only an option for black or white. Um, yeah. I, uh, my ex-husband uh, was born in the 60s in, in Florida and he's Asian and it says he is white because there was no option for anything but black mm -hmm. or white. Um, so you know, there's many more options as, as people have spoken up and said, this doesn't represent me. We see many, many more options. And this is the same thing that we see with dating apps. And it's I mean, I'm just, I, I can't, <laughs> you know, you and I have spoken about, I find the whole idea of dating, much less online dating to be extremely scary. As a single mom, I'm like, every time I think about going on an online dating app, you might find me in a corner sort of shaking, you know, 30 seconds later. And, uh, but, you know, to, to consider that not only are you having to work your way through all of these potential fears and, you know, nervousness about going into the online dating space or the dating space in general, but to once again, feel that erasure of the self or that discrimination of yourself. Right. I, you know, I just want us to really think about that for a moment in terms of how many of our community are having that experience. Yes. And I would add the experience isn't just in trying to represent the self. It's also now you're trying to connect with others and find others. And there's no question that um, the kinds of racist behaviors and racism and sexisms and ageisms and ableisms, all the isms that we see in daily life, we're also seeing in dating, online dating culture. Um, there's um, on many of the gay male sites like Grindr and Scrap and there's, there's often people who will write no fats, no femmes, no Asians, no blacks, like they'll write this as a tagline. It, it became so well known as a tagline that, um, that the website Jacked, which is also a, another um, gay male uh, geolocation uh, site, they put out like a, a PSA, a public service announcement video, and in it, it included that kind of that phrase. And at the end, it says, don't be an app hole. It's like all the ways in which people are being hurtful, discriminatory um, to other people. Um, that was kind of what they were trying to say, like, you know, just because you're online doesn't give you an excuse. Um, don't be sending uh, Un unsolicited genital pics to people before they've said, hey, yeah, like before consent happens. Uh, uh, for men that are um, like, if they're considered feminine, they were getting a lot, a lot more harassment. I mean, so some of these things are not just 
they're not just happening in how we present the self, they're also coming at people as they're scrolling and they're seeing other people's profiles or people are sending them messages and may send, you know, really inappropriate messages. People are doing things that they wouldn't do in daily life on a first meet. Wow. You know, on the other hand, though, you you said that it's also been extremely freeing and liberating for some individuals. Can you speak about that in terms of what you're starting to see? Yeah. So two things. I'll start pre-COVID and say that um, the LGBT community is actually the largest user of online kind of dating apps, at least percentage wise. Um, the numbers show that um, people who have used um, online dating apps to find somebody or to have gone out on a date far more in the LGBT community. And the reason for that um, and what is liberating and freeing is for once there's no question about who is also the, who's gay. So if you're, um, you know, traditionally you either are looking for codes or you're going to places that you know are LGBT friendly or they know it's the gay bar down the street. Um, you're going to, um, events where you know you're likely to meet people who are either friendly or are also gay, right? And so with apps, you're already self-selecting. You're like, we're at the gay bar on this app, right? And, or this is the lesbian space, or um, this is, there's, this is the trans space. This is the totally sex positive space. This is the polyamorous friendly space. This is more of a swinger space. So now there's, there's so many niche apps that at least people are able to find the people they're looking for more easily in ways that they were really doing underground uh, or in, and if you live in a big city, you can find these places a lot more easily. You can, there's a, there are gay communities that are like there's Capitol Hill in Seattle is like a known neighborhood. But if you live in a rural part of the country, you may not have that kind of network and you might not have that ease to find your people and your tribe. Mm. And so, apps have really allowed that and apps allow you to find people outside of your neighborhood outside of your social network and so that especially has been very freeing and and people are very clear about what they want so they can vet a little more easily um, there's also a safety issue so especially in the trans community um, lots of um, they've definitely experienced a lot of problems with crime and people out to hurt them and people like fishing for them like you know, trying to meet them for a date and then physically hurt them, right? And I've heard that in some of my interviews with um, some trans folks that I spoke to. And so one of the things they say is they have a little bit more opportunity and ability to really vet people more slowly in this online space before they show up somewhere. So there's definitely, from a safety perspective, um, I would say post or since COVID, one of the things that's also probably very, uh, very, interesting, I think, especially to people who are owning small businesses and thinking about it in terms of kind of the economics is with COVID, people can't go out to the bars, they can't go meet. So they're having their first dates at video dates. Um, I would say this is the first time online dating is really online dating. Like it's not just an introduction, you know, an introductory kind of service. People are actually spending the time getting to know each other through these apps. And having these video dates and what I'm hearing, especially you can relate to this, Lindsay, as a single mom, is they don't have to get a babysitter to go on a date. They can go in the other room and have their date for an hour while the kids are asleep. So they, it's financially beneficial. Ricky, the tab. Ricky um, I'm just going to stop you for a moment. I want to see, we're having a little some technical difficulties. If just for a moment you could try putting your video off so we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, okay. hang on. Uh, one second. I'm gonna close some apps. I think I have too many apps open. Thank you. Yeah, I, I got the message right as you were telling me. Let's go. Closing, closing. I mean, and I can imagine, this is why I just avoid these things. If I were to have a virtual, <laughs> I'm sure on my virtual date, I would have technical issues from beginning to end. <laughs> okay, low system may affect your audio. Okay, this, it's giving you this message. 
Okay, so I turn off my video for a second. Yes, and we can hear you a little bit better. Okay, all right. And you know, I have to teach normally with this, and this also happens. <laughs> yeah, okay. I've closed just about everything I can close. Thank you, and that is much better. Okay. All right, let's see if it works with video again. Let's try to start it. All right. I just keep pressing it apparently. There I am. Okay. Give it a try. Oh, try turning that video off one more time. So sorry. All right. The fact that it's being slow while I try to turn it off is probably an indicator. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. So you know, talking about in that post COVID that it is allowing for individuals to get a little bit more creative. And mm -hmm. you spoke about that one of the things that was coming out of the research during this time of the buildup of uh, the quarantine and now that the quarantine is extending out, that one of the things people or folks were saying to you was that they were really relying on those virtual meetings or the online dating for human connection. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, one of the things that became really evident when we went into lockdown is that um, people started feeling very isolated, especially people who were either single or living alone, because there's people who were non-monogamous who were out there as well who had other partners or people who were just casually dating a number of people before, or more seriously dating before the lockdown started and all they were And so as people were being people started really experiencing that was feeling very bad what we started seeing is that people needed to find a way to reconnect. Ooh, my speaker is not working. Hang on. Okay. Um, I'm going to grab a different microphone. How about that? Okay. Can you try that? One second. For those of us joining us um, virtually, either on the webinar platform or on Facebook, thank you for your patience as we all I've probably had this experience in the past couple of days, if not months. <laughs> we'll be right back. Okay. Uh, let me get my camera. Let's see if this works. That sounds better. Is that better? I'm, I'm oh. still seeing, is that good? That's much better. Okay, great. I'm still seeing a little exclamation mark by my audio, so, and it says my speaker's having problems, so. Um, all right, there we go. All right, different thank microphone. Thank you for that, and thank you for your persistence there. So I'm gonna have you take it back to, mm -hmm. you were starting to share how we were uh, seeing in the research that that desire for human touch and contact was really becoming so important. Yeah. So what was also interesting is I've been doing follow-ups with people um, who I was interviewing pre-COVID and following up with them each, like every three months to see what was going on since COVID. And one of the things I was hearing was it wasn't so much that people were feeling like they needed to get together and date because they needed to have sex. It was that they needed touch, like people who were living alone were really experiencing that feeling of needing, they hadn't hugged anybody, they hadn't touched anybody, they hadn't talked to anybody in person. And so 
um, dating apps were definitely showing an increase in traffic because people were turning to them as a way to find connection, even if it was just to socialize, if they didn't have a big social network. Um, and people were trying to figure out how they could see other people. So I think early on, people who were single and um, out there dating were trying to figure out if they could maybe just see one person, um, figure out if they should, should they break quarantine? Um, that was a big thing. And some people were experiencing being shamed by other people who were like, you broke quarantine, you should stay home. And I think part of that, what I was also noticing was that people who were alone, living alone, were feeling that they were being shamed by people we didn't understand because they lived at home with other people. Like they had a family or they had a partner and they didn't understand. And so they felt like, don't shame me. Like I'm by myself. I'm completely isolated. I'm, I'm not out in the world. I'm, I'm taking measures, you know, I'm, I'm wearing my mask. I'm, I'm being really careful. And so um, I think we need to also as a kind of as a society um, be mindful that people hopefully will, will make good decisions and that, and that some people are not, as, not jump to assumptions about how people are trying to connect. But as we went into phase two and different parts of the country have kind of gone in and out of reopening, people have continued to try to find ways to reintegrate and to try to um, connect with other people. Uh, the first trend I noticed is that people were turning to, they would meet in the park as a public place to have their first meeting. They would video chat for quite a while, much longer than in the past. People didn't video chat very much in the past. So one, they were using video chat and they were extending the amount of time they were getting to know the know people before they met. Mm -hmm. And they would find a public place because you couldn't go anywhere, nothing was open. And um, parks were like the place. Um, I did have somebody in my research study say, they don't know if they can handle the whole COVID situation much longer because they're getting in such good shape because they <laughs> The only way they can go date is to go to a park for a walk or to go for a hike. So um, this, they want their life back when they went to the bar and ate rich food and had a drink. <laughs> so um, that's not really a bad thing from, <laughs> but it's an interesting trend. <laughs> so um, the other thing is people were trying to figure out how to just expand a little bit, like create a double, a double bubble as Canada was calling it, where you know you kind of connect with maybe just one more household at a time, kind of slowly um, integrate. But the one thing I noticed that daters were doing pretty early that I think is probably pretty fascinating to those of us who kind of can think back to the, the AIDS crisis is that people started using the same kind of strategies around harm reduction approaches that we used with sexual transmitted diseases and thinking about network connectivity and thinking about barriers like masks or can can you uh, if you're having safe sex um, what is what does that look like right what makes you safe and um, for us right now during covid you know we know it's social distance we know it's masks we know it's good hygiene all that other stuff but if you want to be intimate with somebody um, you have this, the same issues were starting to show up and so uh, New York City put together, the Department of Health put together some safe guidelines, which, which is adapted from the pamphlet that was put out in the 80s about having sex during an epidemic. Wow. And, and it talks about things like being aware of how many partners you have, um, choosing to have partners with people you, being, um, having your activities with people you already know more so than new people. Um, that is definitely also a trend I see with dating. Um, people are hearing from exes, people are connecting with exes because it's a known quantity. They would mm -hmm. rather, um, many people are quarantining, you know, just having a, uh, a partner during the quarantine, somebody they might, they probably wouldn't have continued dating or they wouldn't have dated outside of this time period so that they have a person that they have some intimacy with, some connection with, and many people are actually, it's accelerating relationships. Some people are going, wow, this, this is actually a good thing. And some people are going, oh my God, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> there been a lot of divorces, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll see both. We'll see, we'll see both sides. Um, Esther Perel, who speaks about relationships, 
Um, she says the same thing about um, crises are relationship um, accelerators um, yes. for good or for bad. Yes. And so you speak a lot about, and for those uh, business owners or those within their uh, workplace who are thinking about reopening strategies, mm -hmm. you say that there's some really interesting trends that we can take from that data in terms of thinking about our reopen strategy. Can you talk I think, a bit more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I actually just posted an article on Medium this week, and it talks a little bit about that. Um, one of the things um, that's most important is really um, communicating, right? Talking about um, what is um, what is your lifestyle, um, what is your network connectivity, what is your risk, you know, your your risk level in terms of COVID, based on are you out in the world? Do you have somebody who lives in your house that's out in the world as an essential worker, possibly? Um, and then also about your risk, your COVID risk tolerance, like how comfortable are you in being out in the world? So um, some people are like, you know, I'm fine, I'm out there. And some people are like, I'm not leaving my house, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. but most people are in the middle, right? They're like, okay, I'll go to the grocery store or, I'll, you know, so I think first thing is communicating, like having the conversation and that it's an ongoing conversation. And this is similar to the conversations we have about sexual health when we're in relationships and dating um, and we're out there is that we have to constantly check in like, oh, do you have new partners? Oh, do you have, um, have you started bringing new people into your circle? Um, oh, did your kids just go back to school and now they're in a classroom with 20 other people? Um, these are all about changing risk factors around network connectivity um, and also managing that with people's that risk tolerance, which is kind of their anxiety and their comfort or discomfort and fear around getting the virus or being out there. And um, I, I think I was uh, said this to you a little bit earlier, but I feel like it's, it's like the good hiking mantra of uh, we should, uh, everybody should walk the rate or the speed of the slowest, most uncomfortable hiker. So for safety, it's, I think it's that kind of thing. I know that's not everybody's philosophy um, and hiking, but I think with COVID, it's like, if you have a group of five people and um, maybe two households and they're saying, hey, let's, let's have some time together and, you know, and let's, let's have a, a backyard barbecue and um, get together. Well, we have to see how does everybody feel and who's the most uncomfortable. And the most uncomfortable person says, everybody needs to wear masks, then probably everybody has to wear masks. Otherwise, the whole group is not going to be able to get together and everybody is going to feel kind of the, the problems of the distance. Mm. Um, we talk about these approaches too, like the harm reduction approaches, which we talk about with, with drugs and, um, and also with sexual health, is that we know there's no, the only way to not get this is to just not go into the world, right? That's mm. the only way. So if you can take an approach that is about reducing harm, which is, okay, I'm going to wear a mask when I'm in public places. I'm going to wash my hands. Um, I'm not going to get too close to people. Um, but, but there's that point where your harm reduction approaches still have to work with how do you live life? And that is what I'm seeing as people are trying to reintegrate they're starting to date a little bit or a little bit more where they're saying, well, maybe I could see, maybe I could date one new person, but, you know, but I need to know a lot more about them. Um, or as long as we continue to have a conversation and that I know that we're doing all the things to, to, to protect ourselves the best we can, um, then I think um, we can learn a lot from really the research we've done in the past around sexual health and even drug prevention or not drug prevention, but um, drug, safe drug use, I guess is, is, is how that gets. Um, we know people are not going to not have sex for a year during a pandemic, right? Like that's unrealistic. The abstinence approach is probably not realistic for most people. So, and it's not good for people's mental health to not have interpersonal connection. And so finding ways to help people do that. And if you're a small business owner, for example, one of the things you also need to be thinking is if you're having employees come back to work for you, um, having that same kind of talk, what is their network connectivity or can they, can they remote work some days? You know, I mean, I think some of these we, we, people are already talking about, but I think the thing that we're not talking enough about is how much we need to talk about it and how regularly yes. 
we need to talk about it, check in, ask how people are feeling. If people are really stressed out, um, do, they need, do they need a mental health day to not come in that day? Can you, as a business owner, find ways to give people some space to deal with that, um, to deal with the anxiety or the, the need to back up and work at home? Maybe they've, they've had somebody at home just, you know, maybe their partner just found out somebody's positive at their work and now they're stressed out and you don't want them bringing it back to work. You don't, you don't want, as a business owner, you don't want to know that people are walking around not talking about the fact that people in their network are, are testing positive and not talking <laughs> about it. And, you know, and, and it's so interesting because I was thinking that in terms of we've probably moved to a point where we're more comfortable sort of talking about sex and our dating than we are having these uncomfortable conversations about our network and um, our mental health too, as we think about how the lack of touch or the lack of community might be impacting our work. And um, I think it's a real opportunity because, you know, I was laughing too, when I think of uh, our members at the GSBA and myself, you know, as an entrepreneur, we're typically the ones who are leading the hike and not <laughs> thinking about the people behind us. That's how we became entrepreneurs. But, you know, to have to slow down in trying to keep our businesses alive while also really thinking about the mental health impact of this prolonged isolation yeah. and having to have these tough conversations as we think about going back to work, as we're trying to drive our bottom line, while also trying to integrate human need into our uh, reopening strategy. Right. Three things that, you know, I think came out of some of this uh, early conversations that we had and in terms of your research and you're naming it here, you know, for every business leader listening, uh, three things that I think you can take away are um, there's an opportunity here to connect your team members to mental health resources yes. so that they can be speaking to trained professionals if there are things that are coming up in terms of this prolonged isolation and looking for uh, opportunities to connect your employees to mental health hotlines. Mm -hmm. You may not be the person who's best positioned to have these conversations. Yep. Two, setting aside time. I hear you saying you have to be planning time in your workday to have these conversations. Does that feel right? In yeah. Terms of what is that network effect? Well, I think, I think it's a couple things. One, maybe it's, you know, people have regular business meetings. Maybe it's a check-in, right? At, you know, the weekly business meeting, like, how's everybody doing? Anybody have any new exposures? Anybody having any new stresses? Anybody, you know, are, how's everybody doing um, mentally? I think the other thing that's part of this is people are coping with this very differently. Everybody has their own coping strategy. Um, for some people, it's, um, they're aware that they're upset. For some people, they're, they just start crying because they're watching the news so much. Um, for some people, they're choosing really to disconnect from the news more and just like, let's Netflix on comedy and not feel all the bad stuff going on in the world. Um, and so since people, as people deal differently, it doesn't mean they're not struggling is I guess what I'm going to say. So there's plenty of people who may seem like everything's fine. We're fine. Like, you know, got to live life. Like it's all good. Um, doesn't mean they're not also taking the stock and having those moments of like, I don't really want to, I don't want to get this. I'm, I'm going to stay home as much as I can, but my job is making me go in. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and if, and if you're a business owner who has a job where maybe your employees can telecommute, it seems like that might be a good thing to allow them to do rather than everybody has to be in the office. And I, and I've heard of this. I, I know people who are, who are, who are, who were fine when they did the telecommute during the, the lockdown. And then they were like, why are we back in this office just to be here? Um, and for some people it is necessary, right? And for some, so really asking that question of yourself too, from a business standpoint is, do I need people to be face-to-face, -face, right? Mm -hmm. Can they be, and can they be face-to-face -face digitally? And is that, is that okay? And have you found a way to support your team? Like, do you, did you pay for the subscription to Zoom or whatever kind of um, video conferencing software that is reliable? And, and, 
and paid for access for your employees to have it when they work at home, right? Like, have you found ways to support them to do their job in a way that they can do safely and feel emotionally okay with that? Um, I think uh, on top of that idea of, of everybody, the people who are out there being out there is that really, um, those who are most out there we've heard, right, are often the essential workers tend to be more people of color and women. So we also have more vulnerable populations out there that are most at risk. And then add to that, women still tend to do more of the domestic labor at home and the childcare. And as school approaches, for many people, kids are going to be going back to school soon. This is what I've also heard from a lot of parents and the women especially is that they're now expected to still do their job and they're doing more of the work to help the kids with school. So mm -hmm. there's this double duty. I mean, women have often had this double duty. There are plenty of households where men are also doing the work, but there's the statistics show that women still are doing more of the heavy lifting with the domestic labor and the emotional labor at home and child rearing and also homeschooling. So as people are thinking about their employees, um, about a month from now, uh, maybe even less for some schools, uh, yeah. a lot of employees that have children at home are also going to be starting to feel that additional stress again of having to deal with also schools going online that were, they're not, a lot of teachers were not trained to do this. This was not part of their, they're learning it as they go, which means that it's wonky, it's frustrating. And so the stress level is going to get high and I think higher in different ways. If you're, if you're a home alone, you have the isolation issue. And if you're a home with family, you have the issues of lots of people, no space and also managing children. So these are different health things and to be aware of the people in your world are dealing differently and they have very different challenges is, is, is important. And once kids are in school, they're sharing the Wi-Fi more, um, may not be able to get on a conference call when you need. Uh, being really flexible to figure out what works for everybody, I think is going to be hugely important because this isn't going to be over for a while. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I love that you named that, you know, the, that added burden of work and uh, supporting the family is not necessarily uh, just experienced by women. We have a lot of families with very different makeups and we know that that experience can be very common for lots of members of our community. And so as we continue to think about all of these intersections that are adding on top of this, I just love this exploration of what sex and online dating can be teaching us, you yeah. know, as a sort of um, macro or maybe it's the opposite, uh, a micro version yeah, yeah. of what we need to be thinking about right now. I, however, happen to be that business owner and single mom with two kids under 10 who's going to be homeschooling, who's doing a great job with abstinence, which I know everybody out there is really going <laughs> to <know>. um, <laughs> so, Ricky Thompson, thank you so much for joining us today and for all of those out there really taking away these wonderful insights from uh, Ricky around considerations that you can think both in terms of how you're designing your spaces and your workplaces and your in product to be more inclusive, as well as what we can learn right now about our uh, employees and our clients and considerations that are coming up in love in the time of COVID. Thank, Thank you, you for Thank having you. me. <laughs> Thank you pleasure. for having me. See you next week. All right. Bye.